question. And OK, we're on. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I am Anara Tabashaliva, along with co-hosts Dr. Victor Fett, Dr. Katerina Shrey, and our program producer, Professor Larry Shrey. We host a weekly discussion panel on Russia's war on Ukraine with guests from Ukraine, military experts, medical personnel, academics, artists, literary figures, and relief workers. Our panel is recorded and circulated nationally and internationally. We appreciate your comments and feedback. Special thanks to Marshall University Libraries and MUIT for making this weekly event possible. If you are joining us live on Teams, please feel free to use the chat to post questions for our guests. A quick greetings to our viewers in Ukraine from Professor Katerina Shrey. Це святочний час. Вітаємо наших слухачів в Україні з глибоким поклінням. Ми далі свідки вашого страшного терпіння і також вашої великої сили. Дякую вам за вашу участь в нашій тижневій програмі. Thank you. Today's presentation will be introduced by Professor Victor Fett. Thank you, Anara. Uh, today, uh, on this last podcast of uh, second year of the war, 2023, we decided to share our own uh, memories and family stories about connection to Ukraine because uh, two of the hosts of um, this podcast, Dr. Katerina Shrey and myself, we have a family connection and um, uh, things that we are uh, doing and showing here are just uh, a little service to commemorate uh, those people who perished uh, over this tragic century, over this war and previous wars. Our family stories go not very far back, but they span the last century, and uh, we decided to share a few personal uh, reminiscences. Uh, so uh, I will go first, and Dr. Shrey will tell us uh, in the second part of this podcast. Please feel free to ask me questions after uh, I will finish my presentation. Uh, I will share my screen right now, and we can proceed with my family story. It's history in Ukraine, uh, spanning exactly uh, more than 100 years, definitely, but uh, most information that I know was derived from the last um, century. Uh, on the, uh, I will share, I'm sharing the screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 On the left, you can see Odessa. Uh, it's a modern view before the war. Odessa um, uh, was extremely important city in the history of Ukraine, history of my family in Ukraine, history of uh, enormously important uh, diverse population. It's a port city on Black Sea. Uh, everyone knows that it is a prized goal of Russian aggression, which it has not taken yet and hopefully will never take. From Odessa hails my uh, grandfather, my grandmother's family and her parents. On the right, you see Mohilev Podolsky or uh, Mogilev Podolsky in Russian, uh, a city uh, in the Western Ukraine uh, at that time, uh, times of uh, Soviet, early Soviet Union and uh, Russian Empire, it was a border city with uh, then uh, Romania. As you know, Ukraine um, is the southern uh, and the co country, and these are southwestern or southern regions. So uh, here is a little map that I put together. Um, some roots of the family go uh, back to the mid 19th century that we know about. And uh, as you see, my family mostly lived and um, existed in some uh, shape at some generation over uh, southern Ukraine. Never they lived in Kyiv or Poltava or even Vinnytsia. Uh, but uh, let me start from the very first um, known uh, birthplaces. Uh, letter A signifies a very interesting region in the southern Ukraine between um, Kropivnitsky, then Yelisevetgrad, and Mykolaiv. Um, I was born um, in Kriverich, uh, letter D, not very far 
from the place where we first have traces of my family in Dobraya, and I will talk about it in next slide. Uh, that's the birthplace of my great grandfather. My grandfather, who raised me, I will show his picture in a moment, was born in Rivne or Rovna, which is Western Ukraine. And as you know, after the First World War, uh, Western Ukraine belonged to Poland between the wars, and this was Poland. So he was split from his family because he lived in Odessa at this time and studied. But this was after the First World War. His parents stayed in Poland here. Um, my grandmother was born in Uman, very important uh, place for um, Jewish history, uh, the famous shrine place of Hasidism, uh, letter G, and they met and married in Odessa. A lot of people uh, flocked to Odessa, and these were Jewish people from uh, small um, places, shtetls, uh, towns, just like Fiddler and the Roof story, and um, their first language was Yiddish. They spoke Ukrainian and um, probably Polish and Russian was their learned language in this generation in late 1800s. Of course, this was also a place of great immigrations to um, uh, America, to all other uh, countries from pogroms. And the part of my uh, families uh, both on both sides, on all sides, emigrated some to America, some to Europe. Uh, and some to Israel. And uh, my grandfather worked in many places. This is for both grandfathers here, summarized from uh, Crimea to Ismail on the Romanian border, uh, from Odessa to Kriberich, but mostly family history is about um, Western Ukraine, as I said, on the border with uh, then Romania. Moldova did not exist, so this is Dniester River. Um, that's why the, as you might know, the area here was a time called Transnistria behind the Dniester. So geographically, uh, again, my parents, uh, my father was born in Odessa in 1930 and my mother also in 1930 in the city, which has uh, changed its names many times. It was founded as Elizabethgrad by the name of Queen Elizabeth, uh, daughter of Peter the Great, uh, as this area has been conquered um, by Russian Empire from the Ottomans. And then uh, it was called uh, Zinovievsk at one time by the Bolshevik leader. And then when Zinoviev was shot, it was called Kirovograd, another uh, Bolshevik leader who was also shot. And um, uh, uh, today it's named by uh, the famous Ukrainian actor is from there, Kropivnitsky. So this is uh, our geography. Going back to uh, original place, one of the most original places where we tra I could trace for six generations, uh, looks like uh, they lived in so-called agricultural colony. Dobraya means good. And that's where my grandfather, Nahum Okner, lived uh, in the late 19th century. This is grandfather of my uh, mother's grandmother. Uh, it's interesting that family haven't moved uh, much since that because I was born only uh, about 100 miles away from Dobre, um, about probably a century later. Um, all these area are settlements, so-called agricultural Jewish colonies. Uh, it is well known that since biblical times, Jews were not allowed to own land or even work on land. This was one of the Tsarist times experiments in mid 19th century where from newly conquered Polish territories, many Jews were, uh, if you wish, trans, um, transported, uh, ex exiled, trans, uh, transplaced, misplaced, displaced uh, into this uh, very um, fertile land, uh, newly conquered land, basically north from Kherson. Everybody knows Kherson from the news and south from um, what is now Dnieper. Uh, Ekaterina Dar and uh, Ekaterin Oslav and um, Krivoy Rog, which is the mining place where my grandfather worked later. So my paternal grandfather was a doctor, Eli or Ilya in Russian version Fed. My paternal grandparents met in 1920s in Odessa after the First World War, after Russian, during Russian uh, civil war. 
And this is an old picture of Children's Tuberculosis Hospital where uh, my grandfather, whom I knew very well, uh, worked as pediatrician. Few, uh, no Victor, your mic went off. Uh, Yes, thank you. Uh, my grandfather was born to a poor Jewish family. Their first language definitely was Yiddish. I know that he learned Russian at school. Uh, he mostly uh, homeschooled himself, uh, but then he studied so well that he could actually get to France, to Paris, uh, following his older, much older sister who fled with her family from pogroms in 1900s. And for a couple of years, he studied uh, medicine in uh, Paris in Sorbonne, and then he happened, just like in a novel, to return to his uh, parents, to Rivne, uh, as the war started, the Great War in uh, August 1914. He was uh, conscripted, uh, he was shell-shocked uh, in 1915. Um, his hands were shaken all his life, that I remember. Nevertheless, he finished his medical education in Odessa, already in Soviet times, and he worked in many places as children's doctor. And um, his family was saved. My father was 11 at this time um, because uh, this tuberculosis hospital uh, man was managed to be evacuated to Siberia from the war when Nazis came. Uh, as you heard on this program and in many other places, Odessa Jews were severely uh, murdered under Nazis and part of uh, my family also perished there. In other places, um, my uh, great grandmother, my grandfather's mother, uh, his sister, his nieces perished in Holocaust in Rivne and uh, some even were deported uh, in, from France to Victor, your oh. mic has gone off again. S sorry, um, my grand great grandparents, Gdali and Gittel, these are Yiddish names. In uh, Russian, they were called Gregory and Katrin Nikolaevsky. They survived the war also. Um, the great grandfather died uh, during evacuation in Siberia, and his wife, whom I didn't know, died a year before I was born. Here you see her my great-grandmother already after the Second World War. On the right is our family, or rather, uh, I'm not here because um, a person, the youngest uh, baby here is my father. He was born in 1930. And here is uh, my grandmother who raised me um, before I went to school. I lived with my grandparents. This was already in Siberia when uh, the entire family um, came during the war and uh, essentially stayed there. This is early 20s um, when uh, little normalcy came into Russia for a few years. When I say Russia, I mean Soviet Union at this point. Of course, Odessa was part of Soviet Union. Um, uh, this is a little modern map showing where my grandfather worked mostly as a doctor. This is Mikhailiv Padelsky, uh, bordered then with Romania, as I said. Uh, many people would know Chernivtsi or Ivana Frankivsk, uh, Stanislav, Kalameya here, Vinitsa is here, Uman, where my grandma was born, is here. Uh, I heard about uh, these um, uh, years from my uncle, who was born in 1924. He remembered the uh, Holodomor. Uh, he remembered how uh, grandfather, who was a doctor, was not allowed to take food from the peasants because all food was confiscated. So having some uh, corn bread uh, meal was actually a crime. Uh, you have heard, um, our viewers have heard a lot of, about Holodomor. Uh, my family survived. I wouldn't be here if they didn't. So uh, this is already in evacuation during Second World War, 1943. My uncle, who became a very well-known uh, mathematician and physicist and philosopher, uh, in the big city of Novosibirsk. That's where we lived since 1950s. Uh, and my parents actually studied after the war in Odessa, but again were um, 
moved to Siberia for work. And uh, going to another part of the family, these are another couple of my great grandparents who perished in Holocaust in Elisabetgrad, uh, at this time already, I guess, Kirovograd. Uh, their last name is Mali, which is also translated as Klein. This means small. Uh, they stayed uh, while their children uh, were evacuated, um, and this would be my. Your mic just went off again, Victor. I'm sorry, something goes on with the microphone. Uh, I, I'm not touching it. OK, uh, so these are my great grandparents on mother's side, and uh, this is me with my uh, parents already. Uh, just newborn baby. Oh, oh. that's and so sweet. Sorry, sorry. Uh, my father was a brilliant photographer among his other skills. He, is an he was an engineer, computer engineer, one of the first computer engineers in Siberia. Um, uh, they uh, parents used to take us uh, to Ukraine every summer, so Ukraine figured very greatly in my childhood. In fact, uh, the fact that I'm a biologist, zoologist, uh, I um, ascribe it to our summers in Ukraine, especially in the Kherson region and Odessa, where we went. Uh, now I understand it was just maybe for 10 days to the beach, but this was Black Sea, like uh, many, many thousands of uh, Soviet citizens. We enjoyed warm summers uh, at the Black Sea, but we were uh, going as tourists. Basically, we just camped. And uh, here was another picture. Let me see. That's another branch of my father's family. They all perished in Rivni and Rovna because they stayed there. So just like my maternal grandparents, great grandparents and these family last name winners, they stayed. They couldn't leave or wouldn't leave. And uh, uh, Rovna ghetto was entirely exterminated by the Nazis. All uh, relatives who stayed in those agricultural colonies uh, in Kherson region also were uh, killed. Um, villages still exist, but there is no uh, Jewish population. And um, this is my maternal grandfather, who was a mining engineer, because Krivery is one of the largest iron ore places in the world. So all his side of the family were mining engineers, and some, some uh, are still there, uh, many professions. Uh, he was rather young. I now realize uh, my mom's uh, father was 20 years younger than my dad's father. So uh, it's another generation. He had uh, um, uh, my mom, uh, well, was born when my grandfather uh, Moses was just 22. He was a young engineer, and this was right at the before the Holodomor, 1930. Her brother was born in 1934. Uh, Vladimir Mali, uh, also a great mining engineer. He is um, now in Germany. He will be 90 years old, and uh, if he will be watching this, I know he will. Vladimir Maisevich, this these are my uh, greetings to to you and your family, uh, the Dima. And uh, her younger sister, Vera, lives in Israel now. Uh, so that's me at in Kriverich at the festive table. And um, next picture shows a remarkable record because Ukrainian Jewish organizations started putting online the synagogue registers of children's births. And um, if somebody knows Russian, they can see on the left side the record in cursive in Russian. I can read that. But in the right side is cursive in Yiddish, which I cannot read at all. But I found the birth uh, date uh, record of my grandfather. Here it is, framed 1908. So uh, he was only. Uh, Nine years old when Soviet revolution happened. He was a young engineer um, in 1930s, and uh, they survived again because his mining enterprise was evacuated to Urals Mountains, to Chelyabinsk. So uh, and that's me in 1960 in Siberia, where they taught me to read it when uh, at age of five, and I have been reading since that time. And the last frame is uh, a wonderful 
person name, sorry, last name, last frame is Anet Janen. Anet Janen uh, was born in 1929 in Provence, France. This is my second cousin, um, daughter of, uh, granddaughter of my uh, grandfather's uh, older sister, Esther Fett, who immigrated to Ukraine to France, as I said before. The family uh, lost contact for 70 years. In Stalin's times, it was dangerous to write to Russia and correspondence ceased in late 1920s. And uh, essentially, I, I looked for them for many years. I, I found them uh, in 2005 and we met. This was very uh, moving um, family reunion. Uh, parts of families perished in Holocaust, but parts survived. And uh, so our family ties are now not only in uh, Ukraine uh, and um, Israel and Germany and uh, Russia and um, France as well. And of course, United States, where I immigrated already with my family in 1988, um, 80, which is exactly 100 years since my grandfather was born in Western Ukraine. And um, as you know, we started this podcast on 2nd of March 2022. This is our 96 meeting and uh, we do not plan to stop as long as the war goes on. Uh, we're trying to bring you all kinds of uh, personal and uh, analytical reports and stories and people from Ukraine and uh, we hope uh, you will be keeping watching us. I will stop my slides right now and uh, I can take questions right now because in second part of the podcast uh, Dr. Katerina Shrey will tell us about her Ukrainian connection and her family's story. Thank you. Thank you. I see Dean Deutsch. Dean Deutsch has his hand up. Someone's microphone. Someone's microphone is on. Someone's microphone was on. Sorry. Yes. Yes, Len. You can't hear me. Yes. Yes. yes, I I can hear, but if we again have that echo. echo. Uh, yes. I was going to ask you about your poetry. Is it accessible in Russia? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, what I write is online. Of course, anyone can uh, download uh, poems uh, from, well, Facebook is not accessible in Russia right now, that's true. But yes, uh, I have white correspondence um, and uh, a lot of websites still exist where uh, poems are published, yes. Hello? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. This is more of a comment, Victor. For me, you are larger than life. You are an epic human being. Um, it was very sweet to see you as a young child and to see you with loved ones and um, just kind of the, the human side, which I, I very much appreciate. Um, I'm also struck by how much your grandson looks like you. <laughs> it's exactly the same little sweet face. I so just thank you. That was incredibly sweet. Um, I'm just very grateful for you. This show Thank would not happen. Much. This, this, none of this would happen without you. We would not. We would have done one panel. That's it. So thank you, thank you for for championing the cause of Ukraine, um, in West Virginia and and honestly, um, throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, yes. Uh, could you say something about the etymology of your surname? A oh, surname. Um, uh, it's easy. F-A-T, it's um, the same in Yiddish uh, as uh, F-A-T in English uh, or F-E-T-T -T in German. Uh, it simply means fat. And uh, this is most likely a nickname. Uh, like um, my mother, maternal uh, family name is Mali, which means small or klein in uh, German or Yiddish. 
These were nicknames when person was a large, large person. They were nicknamed uh, baby, like, uh, you know, Robin Hood's little John. Um, and um, I think maybe those who were very thin were nicknamed fat guys. <laughs> um, um, but uh, there are many versions. Uh, there is an etymological dictionary of Jewish names uh, with um, geography. And uh, this probably is abbreviation from Fetzer or Fetter, uh, which is which means the same. However, uh, there is obvious coincidence because this is the same name of as of the famous Russian lyrical poet of Anasi Fet of 19th century. And everybody is asking if there is um, a connection. Not that I know, but most likely my ancestors started writing their name as this abbreviation um due to the existence of this uh, famous poet so it was just a, a pretty name uh, well known uh, celebrity name for them and of course everyone is asking if if i am related <laughs> thank you thank you Axt. thank you but we have no uh, more questions right now I will give microphone to Dr. Katerina Shrey, who will introduce herself. Thank you. I am Dr. Katerina Shrey. My maiden name is Rudnitsky, and I'm sitting here with my father, Leonid Ivanovich Rudnitsky. Um, and my story is very much, I'll be referring to him a lot. My story is very much intertwined with my father's and his family's and the Ukrainian community of Philadelphia, where I grew up. And from there, the entire Ukrainian diaspora. Um, it's also closely intertwined with the efforts of the Ukrainian Catholic Church and the Ukrainian intellectual community. These are entities which strove to preserve Ukrainian culture and heritage and identity under sometimes really difficult circumstances. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and we have a brief little PowerPoint, and then I'm hoping to show a film. So I'm here with a, we're looking here at a map. The yellow dots are where we have personal connections. My the family really begins in Ternopi, where my grandmother is from. And my her husband, my grandfather, was a Hutsul. Um, and so that would be a little further west, Tata. Yeah. Yes. And then they they um, the family was established in Lviv, um, which is an amazing city. Um, we also have friends in Ush, former students in Ushhorod. My father has friends and co colleagues in Ivano Frankish. And then for a long time, we had family in Kiev, but they were family that were my generation who grew up here and then moved to Kiev. They've since left long before the war for other reasons, about much long before the war started. But they were there in 2014 and were part of the Orange Revolution. Um, I went to Ukrainian school every Saturday, and the, the four cities every Ukrainian kid learns is Kiev, Lviv, Kharkiv, Odessa. And then we learn about some of the smaller cities, not smaller, some of the other cities. And right now it's really very sad because we these cities all of a sudden, you know, Kharkiv, I've learned about Kharkiv all my life, and now it's in the news. And it's a very, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it hits really hard, um, the, your childhood uh, lessons in Ukrainian school. And now all of a sudden, and as a kid, like I'm sitting here in my my childhood home, um, my parents' home, and I'm surrounded by Ukrainian things. There's I could reach in any direction and grab some kind of Ukrainian artifact, Ukrainian book, Ukrainian something. And I always took all this for granted as a child. And in fact, I have a whole box of Ukrainian stuff um, in my own home in West Virginia. And none of it really was that important to me until the war started. All of a sudden, you know, I started digging through the stuff, trying to find that Ukrainian flag sticker to put on my car, um, looking for things to put in my office in the background so that people would know I was Ukrainian. Here is a picture of my grandmother on my father's side, Yulia Rudnitska, from um, her maiden name is Luznitsky. And um, our viewers may recall we had some by that last name on our program um, several months ago, and that would be her grand nephew. Um, the other photo there is my dad. Um, looking awfully cute. And <laughs> he's sitting here kind of smirking. Um, here's a picture of my father with his father and his mother. Um, and I think, Tato, this is where? This is in Germany or Ukraine? No, this is still Ukraine. Still Ukraine. Yeah. But not long after that, I believe you all had to flee because of the war. And yeah, 1940. So 1940. 
1944, fleeing to Germany, where you spent time in a displaced persons camp. Um, this picture is also my father and his mother um, and his uh, and his father. But I think this is already Germany. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so just uh, pictures of, of my my father as a young man who came to this country, the United States at the age of what? 16. 16 and immediately was thrust into a situation where um, having to provide for for his family, for his it's basically him and his mother. Um, it's interesting because I'm right now the same age as my grandmother was, so late 50s, coming to a new country. And I have a son who's 16, and I wondered you know, how we would fare putting us in an entirely new context, entirely new situation, having to learn a new language and figure things out. But things went really well. And in fact, my grandmother, um, who had a very comfortable life in Ukraine, very, very comfortable life in Ukraine, went to work in a sewing factory, sewing collars on girls' dresses. And this was uh, to, to, to basic, and her whole goal was to get my father to a better place. My father got a job as a gardener and was making good money back then working for a gardener. And in fact, to the point where he was like, oh, maybe I'll, I'll do this. And she's no, no, this is this, you, you have to go to school. And he did. He he did. He he he, he did quite well for himself and for his family. Um, but this story that I, that I tell you about him is repeated thousands of times. You know, this is the generation that my grandmother's generation came. And they worked really hard and often very menial jobs. My mother's mother cleaned floors, um, and she, even though she was a trained nurse um, back in Europe. So this is my father as a young man um, when he became a college professor. And I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and just talk about the Ukrainian community in general, um, because it, it sets up for some of the pictures to follow. So in 2019, um, there were strong Ukrainian conclaves, ethnic conclaves all over the United States. And the one I grew up in, of course, is the one in Philadelphia. But we had friends from New York, Detroit and whatnot, because in addition to having establishments within our own cities, Ukrainian banks and churches and schools, we also had other organizations that spanned the whole country, for example, a scouting organization. So every summer we would together, we would get together with Ukrainian scouts from other parts of the country. Um, there were also programs, uh, the Ukrainian Catholic University in Rome hosted summer courses for people who are late high school, early college. And so we all, many of us got to meet there, even though we were from different cities in the United States. Um, this number has probably changed, but in 2019, there were just a little over a million Ukrainians, sorry, uh, yeah, Uk Americans of Ukrainian descent in the United States. That number has likely gone up. But that number is important because it explains to some extent at least the initial um, support for Ukraine here in the United States. So if there's a million some people like me, but we're married into families, we have our own kids, we have friends. So whereas growing up, Nobody knew what a Ukrainian was. Um, now, of course, everybody knows what a Ukrainian was um, through this horrible war. But before that, people actually cared what a Ukrainian was. Uh, as a child, we were all raised with the same elevator speech. It was important for us to be able to explain who we were. And so it's, it's the same idea that like we're not Russian. We're Ukrainian. It's different. It's an older culture. It's a different language. It's got its own culture. We are a people in exile. Um, at the same time, too, the uh, American media pretty much took everything that um, the Soviet Union at the time said as face value, really wasn't challenged. And so there really wasn't a narrative explaining what a Ukrainian was or, or anything positive about it. Um, Hollywood also lumped in Ukrainians with other ethnicities, with Russians. And um, the other thing, too, is that my father often points out, he's a professor of literature, that uh, Russian literature is mostly prose or largely prose, and it translates really well into English beautifully. In fact, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment is actually a pleasure to read in English, maybe more so than in Russian, I think. But that's a personal opinion. Whereas Ukrainian literature is mostly poetry, um, or at least the, the literature that, that the, the popular literature is mostly poetry. That, that's, there's some, some notable exceptions. All Ishwanchar's Cathedral, for example, would be one. Um, but poetry is, is so much more, uh, it doesn't lend itself as easily to translation. And so even on the cultural as well as political fronts, it's a little harder to establish what a Ukrainian is. 
So family picture. This is a family picture. This is um, this is a, a casual family photo. My parents are here in the lower left hand corner. My mom's wearing the red coat and she's expecting me. That's my father behind her. And so whereas this is a casual family photo, actually each of these people played a significant role in developing Ukrainian culture and heritage here in America. Um, so I'll say a few words about some of them. They kept that while they worked hard to build up the Ukrainian community here, they also kept in very strong contact with their family and friends, many friends, many family left behind, either in the Soviet former Soviet Union or in places like at the time Czechoslovakia, wherever they kind of landed. So up here at, in the upper right hand corner, that's Alexander Lushnitsky, right? And he is He's probably he's the author of like 23 different books on the Ukrainian immigrant experience. He, he his son now lives in Switzerland um, and he was on our program. Um, he also was uh, he, he, he headed a Ukrainian school here in, in Philadelphia. Um, very large member of the very active. In fact, all of them were active. That's the thing. When they they came over, they tried so hard to preserve their culture here. Next to him is his father. This is Rehori Lushnitsky. He is a renowned church historian, um, also a novelist, a playwright, a uh, major figure in the Ukrainian literary scene. Next to him is my grandmother. That's my father's mother, Yulia. Um, and then we're going to go down here to the, to the lower right-hand corner. Um, we have Bogdan Kuchitsky, who married into the family, and he was he was kind of a businessman, but he also like found he was a major player in the Ukrainian Providence Association, which provided insurance. Engineer. He was an engineer by trade, a civic and en civil engineer by trade. Um, but it, 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 none of these people just had day jobs. They all had their day jobs. And then they had like a whole other job that was directly contributing to building a Ukrainian community here, um, not, while at the same time beautifully assimilating into American society. These are all people who like celebrate Thanksgiving with great and Fourth of July with great joy and are grateful to be part of this country that welcomed them with such open arms. Next to him is his wife, um, Christine Kuchitsky, and she is the daughter of Gregory up here and the sister of Alexander. Um, she spent her entire life working for relief efforts for Ukraine, organizing shipments of goods long before this war. God rest her soul, she passed away last year. But she she was very dedicated to, to um, advocating, lobbying for Ukrainian causes. We have the Ukrainian Educational and Cultural Center here in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And she was one of the many people who worked so hard to make that happen, took care of the details, you know, figured out like mortgages, like the practical things, finding the building. Um, also, all these people worked really hard. And here is a, whoops, we're going to ignore that. Here is a, a picture of them a little bit older. This is my father in the middle. And that's Christine Puchitsky, and that's Alexander Luzhnitsky. So not just their efforts, obviously, but the efforts of people like them resulted in so much um, community that even though I grew up in Philadelphia, I grew up in a subculture. The, these churches were, um, three of these churches were built before I was born. This one, the, the one in the lower right hand corner is since when I was a child. But these are just some of the Ukrainian Catholic churches. There's also Ukrainian Orthodox churches um, in the area. And so we have the beginnings of um, a, a, a community established in the form of houses of worship. Um, this is a picture of the Ukrainian Educational and Cultural Center. This is where the Ukrainian Saturday School meets. But long before they had a building, they my my parents' generation just rented um, high schools, uh, public high schools on the weekends. And so I went to Ukrainian school every day since kindergarten while I went to my American school. Uh, and but it was in, often in different places. Maybe there would be like a three year rent contract here, a couple of years here. But in the end, they set up their, they bought, purchased, and and got their own building. This is a Ukrainian bank. It has several branches. This is the Ukrainian Self-Reliance Federal Credit Union. It has many branches actually throughout this area. And this is a, a this place is called Trezup. It's a, a sports complex um, in Horsham, Pennsylvania. And it also hosts many festivals. And there's so much more to it than that. Um, I have with me a, a bunch of books to hold up because at the same time, while, while all this was happening culturally um, to attend to the daily needs of a community and a sense of belonging, also there's 
intellectual efforts being undertaken. Um, and, and that included things like Encyclopedia of Ukraine, the Shochenko Scientific Society, support for the Ukrainian Free University in Munich, um, a, a magazine called Ukrainian Quarterly. So there was a lot of scholarship being done. It, it, it seems like everybody who came did their American work, their American life, and at the same time um, worked hard to to contribute and make possible a Ukrainian life. So these next couple of pictures are gonna look like just name dropping, but they're really not. Um, these are pictures of my father and they're gonna be with, with probably uh, uh, figures that our audience will recognize. But this kind of shows once they, the, the, my parents' generation established a Ukrainian community here in Philadelphia, they worked really, really hard to to extend that into the diaspora. And so there's my father with a Pope. Here he is with Ali Shkonchad, a prominent Ukrainian novelist. I believe this is Helmut Kohl. Do you remember who that is, Tato? This up here. Uh, he's so funny. It's, I think this is the head of the uh, boss of the Yeah, I think it is. I think, yeah. Um, here we have, you know, um, meetings with presidential candidates, uh, vice presidential candidates, presidents, um, testifying in front of various committees on behalf of Ukraine. And then, thankfully, Ukraine becomes free. And when Ukraine becomes free in what, 1991, yeah, um, it, um, but there's already enough relationships established. And so that between the Ukrainian community here and the Ukrainians in Ukraine. So this is Krochuk. Krochuk and this one. First. President. And who is this over here? Uh, Kuchma. Kuchma. I yeah. wouldn't leave him out. <laughs> okay, well, we'll just do it. So, okay, so then um, we just have, there's a lot of, there, there were already connections established because the entire time for decades, there was communication going back and forth. Probably the most important figure um, for my father, and there's my father, is this man here, Patriarch Yosef Shlipi, um, who is just an incredible influence on not just my father, but the Ukrainian Catholic community, and really beyond that, he was very ecumenical. You want to say a few words about him, Tato? This is an incredible, incredible human being. Yeah, well, among other things, one of his great achievements is that he spent 17 years in Soviet prison camps, and there was great pressure on him to convert to orthodoxy, Soviet style, and he, of course, refused. And finally, after 17, or was it 18 years? I'm not sure now. That he was brought to the West and became the head of the Ukrainian Catholic Church all over the world. He was a disciple of another great churchman to whom Ukraine owes its debt, in having maintained its uh, in national identity. That was Archbishop Metropolitan Josef Shlepe. Andrei Shetetsky. Uh, yes, uh, Andrei Shetetsky, I'm sorry. Yeah. He was, Shetetsky was, became part of history of one of those few churchmen who saved Jews during the Nazis. And there are several Jews who have written about him and what he has done. And Shabditsky and Shlepe, kind of the leaders of the Ukrainian, what was known as the Greek Catholic Church as opposed to the Roman Catholic Church, those two leaders contributed much to maintain the Ukrainian national identity in the days where it was in danger of being eradicated by the Soviets as being Russified. And the Schlippe, whom you see here with me, he was one who kind of invigorated not only Ukrainian spiritual life, but also kind of you know, national identity. And that is uh, among his great achievements. Yeah, in fact, he founded the Ukrainian Catholic, or maybe did he find it or did he restore the Ukrainian Catholic University? Oh, no, no, he established. Established the Ukrainian Catholic University, however, in Rome. in Rome. 
however, and with affiliates in the United States. But in addition to that, he recognized that uh, intellectual communities need company. And so when the Ukrainian Free University in Munich was being um, established, he also supported that. Mm. It, was, it was not a competition. It was, in fact, well, it may be but in a good sense. You wanted another institution. So secular institutions uh, as a religious institution, the two universities. So this um this is just another picture of, of you all at some event. That's um, wrong. So this in in um there's so many things I could say about my own like childhood growing up Ukrainian American, but I'm going to show a, a clip from a from a film instead, because a lot of the effort here. Uh, of my parents' generation was to to be sort of like cultural ambassadors, just kind of like, just draw attention to what a Ukrainian was and how it's different from from anything else from being from being Russian. Um, and so there was there was a lot of effort at that cultural awareness. Um, I'm going to show a brief film in just a second, but this is a picture from Marshall University where we're based. Our program is based. And these four little kids now are adults, but these are my kids. They are greeting. Uh, this is me over here. And this is a delegation from Ivano Frankushk in Ukraine. And this is Sarah Denman, the provost at the time. And so the traditional greeting, not just in Ukraine, I think, but in many Eastern European countries, is you greet people with bread and salt and wine. Um, bread so they may always have food to eat, salt because that's a luxury, and wine, I suppose, for it was wine. <laughs> There's my kid. This is one of my kids playing on a flute. It, two of my kids playing on a flute in Ukrainian and you know, all dressed in Ukrainian clothes. Um, and my daughter presenting the tray. So I'd like to switch gears now and I'm going to go to this film that I um, and this is the setup for it. In, in the 1970s, one of the things my father and his colleagues did was get a grant to make a film about U the Ukrainian experience in America. And they focused on a Ukrainian Christmas. And the film's only 30 minutes long. Actually, it's one of his directors went on to be a major Hollywood director. Um, mm. And so that's that's actually quite exciting. Um, so I'm going to set the story up first and then play just a five minute clip. And after that, a two minute clip. So the setup for this is um, a, a young man named Mike is a successful talent agent in New York City. And he is Ukrainian. And when he left home, his father was upset that he was abandoning his role in the Ukrainian family in Philadelphia, that he was rejecting his heritage and whatnot. And so it's actually quite a familiar story, I think, to a lot of immigrant communities where the parents work hard to preserve the culture and the kids are want to be American. And so it's hard to hit that perfect balance. But I think this film kind of ends up doing that. And that's actually very true for my experience and the experience of a lot of my classmates and peers. So in the story, the, the opening scene is Mike in New York talking to his girlfriend saying that he has to go home for Christmas because his father has been diagnosed with cancer and his mother's asked him to come back. And so he is uh, struggling with the tension to please his father and, assimil and stay Ukrainian or continue with the life he loves as an American a successful American businessman. And so the film has a lot of uh, 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 attention to Philadelphia landmarks that are Ukrainian. Um, we won't show this part in the clip, but like there's casual like references to the Ukrainian bank or driving by a Ukrainian church. Um, there's an entire segment about Ukrainian dancing, which is absolutely beautiful, um, but we won't have time to show that here. So here's a five minute clip in this scene. Um, Mike, the successful talent agent, is hanging out with his much younger brother, Andy, and Andy's so excited to have his big brother back. And so here's a five minute clip as they walk through one of the parks in Philadelphia. Uh, we need sound. We don't have sound. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I thought I. Thank you so much for point for for catching that. OK, I'm going to go back just a smidge. It. Thank you very much for catching that. It's going to be fairly quiet, but it's there. Can you hear music? Boy, it's good to have Mike back. There's nobody else like. Us. Yes, Finally, perfect. Those guys at Ukrainian school will believe me. We'll show them those pictures of movie stars he's got in his suitcase. 
I wish Mike and Taco would get along. Is he really that different from Taco? I don't think so. All Mike wants is to be successful, to be American. Tata loves Ukraine. He always talks about it. How he helped Archbishop Shekinsky hide the Jewish kids from the Nazis, and how he fought in the underground against the communists. We talk about Uncle Bodis and my cousins, who have a tough life under communism. We always send them packages, jeans, calculators, and other things that they can't get over there. My cousin Taras sends me stamps, and I have a real neat collection. Mike used to like these things, too. I wonder what happened. Maybe he had to give it all up to become American. But others don't give up anything. My friends are Poles, Irish, Italians, Blacks. But they're all American. We even learn about their history in school. But Ukrainians are never mentioned. Mike says Ukrainian history is not important. Now that makes Tato mad. He says you should know where you come from and who you are. I don't know who's right. I just wish they would agree. Yeah, we can go if you want. Okay, okay that'll be neat. Andreev, what took you so long to get home? It's my fault, Papa. I picked him up and we took too long. I'm sorry. When do we eat dinner? Six, Father. And what time is it now? Seven. Christmas isn't going to be the same this year. Tato's very sick. But Christmas is still the best time of all. I love to decorate the house and the tree and to hang things on doors and windows. Tato says that's not really the Ukrainian way, but it's nice, and he doesn't mind doing it. We live in America, he says. He spends most of his time getting things just right, the way they should be. It's important to him and to Mama. To all of us, he goes all the way to New Jersey just to buy a sheaf of wheat from a Ukrainian farmer. He calls the sheaf Kidur. It stands in the corner of the living room all Christmas season. He puts hay under the tablecloth and does a lot of other things. These are old customs, Tato says. They're older than America, and they're kind of fun. Mama's the best cook in the world. And I get to help her. Every Christmas, she prepares 12 dishes. There's no meat in them and no milk, but boy, are they good. I grind the poppy seeds for the kucha, and I taste them when she isn't looking. Tata really goes for Mama's blush. He says it's better than Grandma's. And Mike loves Mama's piddle here in Holochi. You can't get that kind in a restaurant. Everything tastes better during Holy Supper. Mike thinks it's because we fast all day and we're all really hungry. This Christmas is special because we're all together again. Even Mike and Tato aren't arguing. Tato doesn't admit it, but I think he's glad that Mike is home. And Mike says he's forgotten how much fun Christmas used to be. He just can't stay mad at people during Christmas. If only Tata would get better. God grant that we all meet at this table a year from now. Before we sit down to enjoy this meal, let us remember all those that we left behind in our homeland, and especially Uncle Boris and his family. This empty place is theirs, so they can share this meal with us in spirit, if not in person. Sasha, 
Zajca. Slavite jeho. Če možem se lahko razovati? Budi laska, budi laska. Hristos, istini Boho naš, rodivši v vertepju v klem judejskim, i v jasnah vzih spasenja našo rade molite v brđesti svoji matri, v šute oče našo, Jano Zultru, Srbistva, Konstantina Rada, šute oče našo, muške i safataši, v hrami vših švetih pomili i spased nas, jak blahi i čelovi, ko ljube. So the story then continues um, with uh, other interactions as the main, the main character, Mike, runs into an old friend. He experiences some more of the Ukrainian cultural, um, common Ukrainian cultural experiences. And then towards the end of the story, he, there's just a lot of Ukrainian dancing in this. Um, that's him talking to an old friend who's now teaching Ukrainian school. Um, they're talking about why you have to assimilate, why can't you keep your culture? Um, normal conversations. Then the father in the story is the editor of a local Ukrainian newspaper, which again, that's that's a real thing. There was there's actually two Ukrainian newspapers um, in the Philadelphia area, uh, major ones, and then there's a number of, of smaller efforts. So towards the end of the the film, the son comes back and he and his father have a good conversation. And this is the last clip I'll show. It's um, Two and a half minutes long. And by the way, there were Ukrainian typewriters. We have a Ukrainian typewriter, which is to me crazy that, that we had a Ukrainian typewriter, but sure enough, what he's typing on. Here we go. I'm, uh, look, I'm sorry about the other night. I was not trying to take Andy away from you. You must try to understand there's a whole world out there, and any young man is going to want to try to explore it. I was wrong to break off so completely the way I did when I left home. And don't think it was always easy. New York can be a frightening place when you're on your own for the first time. There were many times I wanted to turn around and come home. But I didn't. I stuck it out. And slowly, things began to get better. And when I look back on it all, it was worth it. At least you could show some gratitude. It wasn't easy for us when you first arrived here. It's a strange new place. The strange language, the menial work I had to do to put bread on the table. There were actually times when I wished. No, we had no choice. We had to live our lives the way we thought was right. But you see, what I did wasn't so different. I had to take control of my life the way you did. No one forced you to leave. No one forced you either. It's not the same, but we both made a choice. The stakes are much higher for us. 
it wasn't just individual survival. It was the survival of the whole community, of culture. While they are trying to destroy it over there, we build it here. And we can be proud of what we have done. Churches, newspapers, schools, communities. And not only in this country, but all over the world. We tried to preserve our language and our culture and pass it on to our children. Is it all going to die? It's not going to die, but it's going to change. It has to. Maybe. I am grateful to you and to Mama. What you two have given me will always remain with me. It's part of me. I hope so. Okay. Well, so that is towards the end of the film. And then there's a reconciliation scene um, and the family looks like things are going to be good going forward. So the significance of that film, not the best quality and certainly very dark in terms of the filming, but the, the significance is that it was made at all. It was made in the early 1970s. Um, only one person there is a professional actor, right? The, 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 the guy who plays Mike. Everyone else, are, I'm in it. My father's in it. You can you don't know us, but like in there because we're much younger. But every everybody else in the cast, including um, the young man, uh, Andy, through whom, through whose eyes we see the story. That's actually my best friend from childhood. Um, the woman who plays the mom, she's not a professional actress. She's just some oh, amateur. amateur actress. Yeah, and so the, th that movie was made with a grant from the National Endowments for the Arts or Humanities. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, the, um, it's, it's, it was a collaboration between you and several other professors at LaSalle that University. Was, uh, yes. It was fun making it, and nobody actually was uh, expected great things, but it became very popular uh, in various institutions. The first one to order it, I remember, was a Jewish old age home. Yeah. And from then on, it went on from, and it is still shown at places uh, during Christmas, as you have just seen <laughs> thanks to you. But, and what it does is it it it's it's a kind of a short way of embodying the immigrant experience. And again, lots of other cultures went through the same thing. The details are different, but that that um, sense of longing for your heritage at the same time balanced with the desire of the younger generation to become American. Um, that I think that's a very common experience of anybody who is transplanted from their home country to another country, especially if it was something that was not planned. And it does make you very sympathetic towards the refugees here, although they are coming into a community that's quite quite established and welcoming in many cases. In any case, that's what um, what I have to share, I, I do want to say the the Kulyadnike, the the Christmas carolers. Um, that is a tradition that continues. In fact, I was just at my brother's house um, on Christmas Day, and like 20 young kids, all I think mostly from Ukraine. Some were born here, but mostly from Ukraine came, and were absolutely like celebrating their culture with the full singing of carols and a little play in between about um, about the joy of the season. So. Happy to answer any questions, but at the same time, mostly grateful for a chance to tell a little bit about um, how I got to this point and uh, how I never in my life thought we would be doing, first of all, I expected this terrible war to start, but the, um, the chance to kind of share a little bit about how Victor and I both got to this point to be part of this program. Thank you very much, Katerina. This was very moving and uh, extremely fitting the holiday season especially yeah. uh, i hope uh, our viewers will enjoy it uh, please questions in, in case you're wondering in the um when i say i'm in the movie it is all amateurs so when the door opens and there's christmas carolers i'm the girl in the middle <laughs> And before me is my brother, next to me is my sister, and then are your your friends' kids. So this is all this is all just like amateur, so completely amateur. It's the Ukrainian community attempting to 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 
kind of raise awareness about what Ukrainians are, just just positive attention to to Ukrainian culture in America. It's very wonderful, and uh, we all are grateful to you and uh, Dr. Rudnitsky for presence, uh, which will last with us forever, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, as we go on, we hope that next year will be year of victory, and uh, with millions, we hope that the tragedy will stop in its tracks. Um, we will be here, I hope, until it does. Uh, questions, please. Um, I have a question. Uh, I see that religion united Ukrainians, correct? And, uh, yes. Yeah, and at the same time, some Ukrainians are follow Orthodox ch Russian church. How this happened among actually uh, uh, Ukrainians in uh, America? How they resolve their differences here? Well, I think it is the positive influence of America mm -hmm. that it exerts a certain uh, tolerance. And uh, the two churches, the two major churches, we also have, of course, the minor churches, but the Orthodox and the Catholics uh, cooperate yeah. quite often. They work together, and uh, it's a very productive coexistence. Uh, and uh, I think it has transferred itself to some extent into the Ukrainian homeland. There is no animosity at all. Of course, the church, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine was highly Russified, much more so. The Ukrainian Catholic Church was forbidden under the Soviets, didn't exist officially. But the Russification of the Orthodox Church, well, now it has stopped the war. If it has done anything, it's really made the Ukrainians feel that their national identity much more stronger than before. Uh, and together with a kind of now, unfortunately, a, but quite understandably, a strong animosity against the Russians. And that will last a long time. But uh, all in all, in this country, there is a spirit of ecumenism, a kind of friendship and cooperation that reigns between not only the Orthodox and the Catholic Church, but also the Ukrainian Protestant churches, like the Baptists and others. Yeah, I think that's true. Like growing up, it was always you were the fact that someone was Ukrainian kind of overrode everything, you know, Ukrainian and in some sort of faith life. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's interesting now because this is the first year that Ukraine switched to celebrating Christmas on the 25th. And this has got to affect the Orthodox way more than the Catholics, mm -hmm. because we've always had that option of going by the Julian calendar or Gregorian calendar. Mm -hmm. um, so we were at um, we, we were visiting with. Our, in fact, the, the young the, the young man in the movie, his name is Ilya Lavunka. He was um uh, we just saw him a couple of days ago and he just got back from Ukraine. And so we asked him, well, how is that? Like, how how are people reacting? And it's more like a resignation. Like they realize, yes, to be closely aligned with the West, this is something we have to do. No one's thrilled about it, but they also seem to kind of be very accepting. But he only, the people he speaks to, I think are Catholics. I don't think, I don't know how the Orthodox feel about that because that's much more ingrained in, in their uh, religious establishment. The old calendar. We call, we call the old calendar the Julian calendar. Yeah. Uh, that was my uh, uh, second question about uh, tra actually transition of Christmas Day, and because I grew up in Soviet Union and I knew how Soviet uh, regime supported as uh, January the seventh yep. mm -hmm. in order to make it not just religious celebration as a like a worldwide celebration mm -hmm. and people are just used and grow up with this uh, uh, day as a actual second new year 
They, mm -hmm. Of course, uh, during Soviet times, they did not say that it's a religious. Uh, they presented no, this as a actually uh, as a just a uh, 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 Soviet so, Soviet celebration, and uh, and that's why uh, people celebrated actually New Year three times. First time it's, uh, it's on thirty first. Second time on the uh, uh, January seventh, and third time it's on the thirteenth. Yes. Slash yeah. Uh, January because that's uh, and they kept their Christmas tree till the 14th or 15th so that was a uh, uh, normal so that they accepted somehow but not very rare uh, when they celebrated on 25th and that's why I just understand how it was not it was not easy for their actually uh, Western Ukrainians to dare to challenge this actually uh, their uh, regime and uh, celebrate according to their actual calendar. <laughs> yeah, well, that was even a thing growing up in the immigrant community here. I remember that, so that the church we attended, the priest I, would celebrate both calendars 13 days apart. And then a church was built, Sveto Mikhailo, that was St. Michael's. St. Michael's the Archangel, that was dedicated, 100% was going to follow the Julian calendar. And so half of our parishioners left and went to that. Just, it's a big deal here. My father's best friend uh, for his entire life here in Philadelphia celebrated by the old calendar. And he always had this funny joke about he got his Christmas tree for free because <laughs> people just threw them out. Um, all the presents were half price. Um, so there, there's some good humor about that. But that that actually, I think of all the things that came over with the immigration, that was a that was a hard thing for us. That was hard because I remember I definitely had friends who did not celebrate until the we we celebrated um, by the Gregorian calendar, and so did your uncle, and so we were in that part of the family. But there are parts of our friend circle that celebrated by the Julian calendar, and there it wasn't tension, but it was there's some little bit of awkwardness, especially not so much Christmas but Lent, because Lent for Orthodox is very severe. There's no meat for the entire forty days. For Eastern Rite Catholics, it's there's no meat for some parts of it, and no milk products for some parts of it. But that is hard because that affects your eating. You literally what you can consume. And so if we're off and whereas Christmas, old calendar, new calendar, there's always a 13 day difference. Lent can be very different because it has to do when Easter comes, right? So tell you, Bisha, tell me about the two That could be, that could be actually, there could be up to a three week difference, which is, yeah, yeah which is significant when you're fasting and then your half your family is feasting. So yeah, the calendar thing is interesting. We'll see how it, you know, looking forward to hearing more about how, how that goes or I suspect most families in Ukraine who celebrate on January 7th will continue or January by the old calendar it's Christmas Eve then Christmas Day 68th I, I suspect that they will just have two celebrations and that's what a lot of people here in, in the immigrant community do thank exactly. you for asking no I just was I like that in your uh, video you showed this is a very important uh, celebration that unites people at the same time it unites and divides but they people found their way how to be together in, regardless of uh, certain political decisions yeah so some I, even some even enjoy the idea that they can celebrate christmas twice that's true you know <laughs> and this you know the old and the, and the new right now though it's definitely in ukraine that the greek catholics the catholic church is in the new calendar in other words the gregorian calendar I think it's amazing how people transform this religious celebration into just mm. family celebration mm. and uh, I think uh, a common celebration that's I think amazing moment thank you for the nice uh, uh, nice movie or oh, it's like movie you'll see this like movie because people play yeah. there mm -hmm. I think this was his only effort at direct at, at being part of a film team <laughs> I think this was it you're well, retired I was, films I was <laughs> no, fun, but. Yeah, it was fun, and I think that's a very good philosophy behind this. It's not only Ukrainians who cherish their uh, uh, religious uh, uh, background, but there are many uh, yes. migrants thinking how they can accommodate their mm -hmm. celebration uh, with the, uh, and be good Americans. So that's why I think it's a very nice uh, uh, movie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
Thank you very much, Anara and Katerina and Dr. Rudnitsky. And I think this is a wonderful uh, point to finish our holiday season podcast last in 2023. And we will be here on January 5th, uh, hopefully with our friend uh, Dr. Strizak from Kiev, telling us about what's going on. Right now, we know there are still bombings and uh, attacks. Uh, we will ask Dr. Shrey to say a few words in Ukrainian now, please. Дорогі братя і сестри в Україні, ми зберігаємо вас у наших щоденних думках і молитвах. Нехай милосердний Бог тримає вас у своїй опіці. До наступного тижня. Прощаємося. Слава Україні! Героям слава! That's time.